why religious people don't like Jesus, and if they do like him, it's because they've remade him into their own image instead of being made more like him. <clears throat> Reminds me of a college paper I had to do once. It was a short one, only a few pages long, so I restated the <laughs> introduction several different ways several times. Uh, one of the most hypocritical things that we humans share in common is how much we hate hypocrisy in others. Have you noticed that? Everybody in the world hates other people's hypocrisy. And we're all really good at seeing other people's hypocrisy. And isn't that amazing that uh, everybody in the planet is able to point at other people and yet not one of us ever, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But we tend not to see the hypocrisy in ourselves, don't we? That's something we share in common. Humanity is so, uh, seriously, we're so adept, so skilled at disdaining and being fed up with the hypocrisy in this political group, the hypocrisy in that nationality, the hypocrisy in that racial group, whatever, the hypocrisy of people with money, the hypocrisy of people without money, whatever, hypocrisy of people who are ed educated elite, the hypocrisy of of people who think that they're so wonderful because they don't have an education. Uh, we're so good at being distraught, worked up, and ticked off at other people's hypocrisy. Seriously, this should be funny. This should be a joke. I mean, what do angels think? Yeah, they are hypoc hypocritical, you're right, and wow, they don't really see it, do they? No whole planet full of them seeing everybody else's hypocrisy and feeling very confident that, very thankful that they're not like other people. You know, these guys are messed up. Yeah, I know. Why does the big guy love them again? <laughs> Mostly, we don't notice our own hypocrisy because we're so busy looking down at other people. Honestly, hypocrisy is one of the things, and I was thinking, what do we humans do well? Well, at our best, we do art. We are architects, we do science, mathematics, but you know, that's only a few people that do those things well, and some do one thing well, not another. But what is it that across the board, everybody seems to do well? We're really good at being hypocritical. It's like, a, it's like this accomplishment of humanity. To be a human being is almost to be hypocritical. Well, I, should, I, should make, I want to make a caveat to that. To be a fallen human being is to be hypocritical. It's just one of the things that we do better than, than most of the other things we do. I condemn you for your racism. People like me, we're not racist. I, I condemn you for your elitist mindset. Us common folks don't feel superior like that. Look at those country bumpkins, so proud of their ignorance. I'm glad we're not proud of self-righteous. And that leads right into the other things we humans do very well. We, we know how to style on a high horse. Of riding in, posing, looking wonderful. And the, the, thing, the beautiful thing about a high horse is you look down at everybody else. Coming through town. Clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. All those people who don't know as much as we do. This goes right along with our penchant for hypocrisy. Human beings do this so beautifully. And isn't it interesting that when the God of the universe comes down, what does he do? He washes feet. What does he do? He's a servant king. What does he do? He humbles himself to even be spit on and beaten up. He thinks he somehow has this impression of humanity. I, he's obviously wrong, right? He thinks we're so full of ourselves that we need to be broken of our pride and learn how to be humble. I know, right? <laughs> Who does he think he is? When Jesus comes down, he wants to teach us to be honest with our sins. He says, now you go take that log out of your own eye. You know, this is a, the imagery of you got a log in your eye, you know, to take out a splinter out of somebody else's eye. And then he's constantly teaching his disciples how to be humble. 
God thinks this is something we don't do well. This whole humility thing, owning up to our own sins thing. What's really cool, and I'm personally really good at this, it's really cool when we can be hypocrites and look down at everyone else and at the same time, see this is dual wielding, I'm looking down at everybody else, I'm being hypocritical, at the same time I pat myself on the back uh, for how good I am, for how religious I am, for how upright, uh, upright I am. Do you see that kind of maneuver there? Not only am I looking down at people, but I'm at the same time telling myself how good I am. What am I doing? Well, religion, faith in God, where our dear Savior died for our sins, says, humble yourself, come before the cross. I'm suddenly using God's name. Say, I'm going to use your name. Thank you. You don't need it. I'm going to elevate myself and look down at other people, and I'm, I'm going to sin and at the same time put, God, put the, God's stamp right on it. In the wrath of God thunders against such foolishness. And all of us have this tendency, because of the slippery slope of sin, if we're not struggling for humility, we start to feel elite. We start to feel superior. We start to feel like, I'm going to look down, at, I'm going to use religion to make me and mine better than everybody else. Of course, it's not really me and mine. It's me and mine when we're dealing with the rest of the world, but it really kind of whittles down to just my church, right? And then just some people in my church. Well, really just my family, right? Well, I'm not really sure everyone in my family quite gets it. You know, just me, which is what Satan wants to do all along anyways. Isolate us, make us alone. Jesus wants to bring us into one family, bring unity, and unity takes humility. Right? Why religious people don't like Jesus? Oh, I like Jesus. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit's working on us, we love him, don't we? But sometimes we call something Jesus that really ain't Jesus. Jesus supports my policy on school vouchers. And if you disagree with me on this politics, I don't care if it's in Scripture or not, if you disagree with this, on, then you are lowly and I'm wonderful and high and mighty. Jesus made the animals so he's a protector of the environment and if you don't agree with me on every detail of how to protect the environment then there's something wrong with you and you're not let's see using god uh, we're not near uh, broken about this as we should be using god in order to push our own agendas to elevate ourselves to judge other people it's really really pukey really disgusting and yet we're so capable of it using religion to make ourselves feel better superior to others wrap our superiority complex up how about this in the flag and then call ourselves patriots get real smug and talk disdainfully of the closed-minded backward elements of our society that are not as open-minded as ourselves you ever see that maneuver you could get a bunch of people on a talk show sitting together telling each other, you're awesome, you're awesome too. Why are we awesome? Because we're not closed-minded and backwards like those other people. Yeah, we're really open-minded and we affirm everybody unlike those people. Yeah, I know. And then you could get a bunch of talking heads on TV just building themselves up, say, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful too, because we agree with one another that we're not like those people who are closed-minded and unaccepting, like us. Seriously, it's a joke. And seriously, we're so good at this. I don't care what political party you come from, what country you come from. I look down at you because of the clothes you wear. I look down at you because I don't like the food you eat. It's weird, and that means you're below me. I, don't, I look down at you because of this or that, whatever. We, we, we are so skilled at finding some detail. You live on this side of the tracks. You live on that side of the tracks. You have this education. You have that education. We're so skilled at finding an excuse, finding a reason to look down at other people. Look at them. They don't dress up for church. They don't really care about the things of God. 
Look at that person. They think church is a fashion show. And they, oh, my goodness, and the angels are coming. Come on, people. Start worshiping the Lord, right? I don't like the way they sing. I don't like the way they pray. We're so good at finding a reason to elevate ourselves, which is like the exact opposite of things we should be doing in church. Elevating ourselves and dehumanizing, devaluing other people. This is a scourge on Christianity. But God knew what he was doing. He loves us anyways. Thank goodness. He's working on us, all of us. Not just our church, all the churches that are, that are trying to love him and, and lift, up the, lift up his word. Ever hear anyone say, listen to this, it's so wrong of you to judge anyone. You, you, don't, you didn't catch what you did there, did you? It's so wrong for you to judge anybody. You can't say anything's wrong. You, you're not getting it? <laughs> wow, you're not getting it. How dare you share your faith? You can't tell other people what to do. But I'm not allowed to share my faith? That's right. So you're allowed to tell other people what to do. That's right. You know. There's something about religious people, though, that makes being hypocritical and self-righteous even worse. And I've already touched on this. It's because we dress up our sins and we call it piety. And we use God's name to elevate ourselves and devalue other people exactly the way Christ didn't. Did you catch that? We look down at other people and say, it's piety. We feel superior to other people and say, it's spirituality. We elevate ourselves so we can devalue other people, and it's exactly the way Christ didn't do it when the king got down on his hands and feet to wash some feet. And boy, the feet didn't smell as bad as the stinky attitudes of those disciples. One of the surprising truths about Christianity, and it comes through again and again in Scripture, this is, this is, if you want to understand your faith, listen. One of the surprising truths about Christianity is that it is a religion based upon the rejection of religion. You open your Bible and you find this is a religion based upon the rejection of religion. Now, that's confusing. I know that's confusing. But it's because we use this word religion, one word, to mean a couple different things. We use the same word to mean a couple different things, and that's why we get confused about this. Uh, on the one hand, we use the word religion to mean belief in God and the effect that belief has on the way, has on the way we live, think, and act. Religion is our proper response to God. That's good. God's not opposed to that. That's good and proper. Uh, religion, that our faith in God should transform our thinking, our attitudes, our lives. Jesus Christ was the one who, who died to create the church. The church is called the body of Christ. The church is a family. Uh, all of these things are instituted by God. And so when we say, I reject religion, I don't go to church, we're really rejecting God's vision for his family, for those who put their faith in him. So when we talk about Living out our faith, that's religion the way it should be. And God obviously does not reject that. But there's another meaning sometimes attached to the word religion. And this was the kind of religion that Christ was opposed to. And you can see it. He's battling all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus takes it to the religious elite. He battles religious mindsets. He battles our human, human ingrained way of thinking about religion. Because all over the world... Every religion, people use it to look down at other people. And God says, we're not going to play that game. People use religion the way they use any other element of their culture, to a way to feel like we're the really cool people, we're the really good people, and everybody else just doesn't get it. And God says, true religion doesn't play that game. You're going to get on your knees, you're going to get right with me, and then you're going to learn to love other people, and you're going to serve them, and you're going to... Pray for blessings on those who don't like you. In this sense, this religion that God is opposed to, that Christ battles against throughout the Gospels, this sense of religion means tradition, human tradition and rules based upon a belief in the supernatural that some people are going to use then to manipulate or control other people 
and feel superior to them. Jesus, God incarnate, went after that with a stick. He waged war on that kind of religion. God hated it. God hates it. You can see it throughout the pages of the New Testament. So, brothers and sisters, we have to be very careful that we have to guard our hearts, right? So that we don't start using religion to put a, a stamp of approval on our culture, on the way our church does it, on the way I do it, and to start looking down at other people. Well, this is the way mom and dad did it. This is the way grandma and grandpa did it. This is the way we do it in America. God stamp. This is the way we do it in my family. God stamp. And you guys, I can hardly stand to look at you because you don't do it my way. God stamp. And God is saying, Jesus, my son died for those people. I love those people. I want them with me. Can't hear you. Too busy stamping your name on everything. We use God just to endorse what we already feel like instead of being broken by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, God incarnate, hated that. And listen to this, not just because he hated being used to support the egos of wicked people. Guess what? He hated it because Jesus loves the Pharisees too. He knew that, was, that attitude was bad for him. He knew that their cheap knockoff religion was ultimately worthless, couldn't save their souls, couldn't bring blessing to their life. It was a sad trade-in for the real thing. This man-made religion that we manufacture, sad trade for the real thing. We want the real God. We want the real Lord who comes in and convicts us of our sins. The real God who teaches us to love people when they don't treat us right. The real God who, who comes bursting into our, into our lives with this Holy Ghost fire and he burns away the bitterness, he, he burns away the anger, he burns away all these grudges and lists of <coughs> things we can't stand about other people. Excuse me. Jesus was at war with the Pharisees, not because he hated self-righteous religious hypocrites, but because he loved them. I'm glad Jesus can love self-righteous religious hypocrites, aren't you? We'd be in a pickle if he didn't. Jesus is working on us because he loves us. And he wants to transform us. He wants to make us all like him. Jesus had a lot of confidence. He says, you've got to be like me. Yeah, we do. We've got to be more like Jesus. Let's turn to, to Luke right now, and I want you to think about this war between God and human religion. And I'm going to reread some verses from last week. Luke chapter 5, from verse 27. And as I'm reading, I want you to think about how Jesus is trying to shake people up and teach them a new way of thinking about religion. Uh, 27 to the end of the chapter. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, remember that's Matthew, sitting at his toll booth. He was somebody who was rejected. He was a traitor. Couldn't get more despised than that. Who wants a traitor in their midst, in their church? Jesus chooses him to be one of his followers. And Levi got up and he left everything and he followed Jesus, just as we need to leave behind our sins, our lusts, our greeds, uh, our greed, our anger, our self-righteousness, all these things we leave behind to truly follow Christ. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to the, their sects, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, guys, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so the disciples of the Pharisees, but you just go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He, said to, he, said, he told them this parable. No one tears a piece 
out of a new garment to patch on an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. He's telling them, he's, he's battling with the Pharisees. He says, I know you guys like the comfortable old way of doing things. But God has some new wine, and uh, you're going to have to leave the old way of doing things behind. Jesus did not come just to put a patch or to, uh, on an old garment. Brand new garment. He didn't come just to pour the God's beautiful truths into the old structures of the way humanity had made religion. See, he's not rejecting the Old Testament, is he? He's rejecting all the man-made structures of religion. He said, I didn't come to do that. We need new wineskins, new structures to hold this new work of God. And then, uh, you know what was interesting, though? And I just mentioned this briefly last week. The Pharisees, scribes, some of the priests, and the priests could, uh, among the priesthood, there were some who were Sadducees, some who were Pharisees. The Bible tells us that some of these folks that were always so hard on Jesus, and honestly, Jesus was pretty hard on them, uh, some of those folks came around. God has a way of gaining unexpected victories. We don't expect to see, and we've seen this several times already with, uh, with, uh, with ISIS and with the other terrorist groups in the Middle East where we see a hopeless situation. People are coming out and finding faith in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing. God has a way of gaining unexpected victories. John chapter 12 tells us that some of the Pharisees secretly came to believe in Jesus Christ. Now at that time, before his resurrection, they were afraid to publicly admit it. Uh, some of them, uh, a great number of them, after his public resurrection, after the beginning of the church, they come out and they join the church. In Acts, we see that a number of Pharisees, scribes, and even some priests are now followers of Christ. So you look at the, the New Testament and see Jesus call them, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites, you know, and we see them plotting to kill Jesus, and we think, wow, there's never going to be. But Jesus knew what he was doing. He wasn't just calling them names. He's breaking down these old, hardened walls of, of religion. He had to break them down, and Jesus did kick in the, the gate. <laughs> and a number of those folks actually came to put their faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because Jesus loved them enough to tell them uncomfortable truth. But at this time, Jesus' mission is, in part, Jesus' mission, listen, is being defined by his opposition to religious establishment. Isn't that funny? Our religion, in large part, is based upon the rejection of, of religion, man-made religion, human religion. Uh, his religion is, uh, what Jesus' mission is defined by his opposition uh, to the temple in the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. This is a big theme in the Gospels. The way God wants us to do religion and the way we humans naturally do religion are not the same. Well, what does that mean? That if we just naturally follow our own inclinations, we're going to do it wrong. That's why humans do religion wrong all the time. Because we're not letting the Holy Spirit convict us. We're keeping him at arm's length. We're, we're, we're pushing back. Let me repeat that again. The way God wants us to do religion and the way we humans naturally do religion are not the same. Jesus doesn't play games with faith. He doesn't play marbles with diamonds. He isn't going to let us try and manipulate God for our own purposes. And that's why religious people often really don't want to know Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible. So we make Jesus into our own image. We try to make Jesus more like us. Jesus really, really likes uh, American Christianity in the year 2015. The way they did it in the 1950s, I don't think he'd like that. He didn't like that kind of music. Or, or the way they did Christianity in Europe at that time, uh, no, he wouldn't like that. Or the way they do Christianity in some other countries, uh, no, they don't even have air conditioning in their churches. There's no way Jesus would like that. Uh, I mean, we, we think weird things like that. The way we humans do religion 
is not the same as the way God wants us to do religion. So we reimagine Jesus to be more convenient. We try to make Jesus more like ourselves. And you've heard me tell you this joke before, but it was commonly said that German 19th century theologians went on a quest to find the real true Jesus. And they went through their scriptures, these liberal 19th century German theologians. They were cutting out stuff that Jesus really wouldn't say or Jesus really wasn't, wouldn't think. And surprisingly, at the end of their study, they ended up with a Jesus that looked exactly like German liberal 19th century theologians. You know, we're tempted to do the same thing too, aren't we? Jesus likes everything we like. He doesn't like what we don't like. Sunday school, absolutely. You know, Sunday school was just started just a few decades ago. I think it's a good thing. But I'm not saying churches that don't do it are wrong. Most of Christian history, we didn't have it. The New Testament church didn't have it. Liberals like to make Jesus into a glorified social worker. I was reading some comments by a liberal writer. Why don't people understand that Jesus didn't judge anybody? He loved everybody. It didn't matter. There's no such, Jesus wanted us to know that there's no such thing as sin. I thought, well, that's interesting. Thus saith you. Oh, what are you, you just going to talk and we just believe it? If you're throwing this away, why even pretend that you care what Jesus said in the first place? Jesus said, Remember to the woman who was going to be stoned for adultery? Go and sin no more. Jesus loves us so much, he doesn't want us to ruin our lives with sin. We can't just make up stuff. Liberal Christians tend to make Jesus into a glorified social worker and ignore his message of repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, conservatives, we are not going to be outdone by the liberals. We, can, we are pretty adept also at changing God to, you know, we are great at using the name of God to oppose illegal immigration. Where is that in Scripture? Global warming. How is that a religious thing? That is an issue that science settles. Now, scientists may be wrong about it, but it's not a religious issue. God. <laughs> what? Well, if your science is wrong, now you've just embarrassed God. Congratulations. Anyone who looks, acts, talks differently than we do, clearly is less of a Christian than we are. No, that's not true. I'm playing devil's advocate there, okay? Please understand, I did not just say that. That's not what I'm trying to teach. Brothers and sisters, what did we call this a little while ago? Pocket deity, remember that? When God gets so convenient, I can just reach in my pocket. Uh, I hate people who do like that. Here's my pocket deity, bless, bless. Now, <laughs> it's sacred. My hatred is sacred. Pocket deity, when God gets too convenient, guess what? Maybe you're not really talking about God. You're just talking about something your imagination made up. We need to start questioning when, when all we do is use God to consecrate our own policies, our own feelings, our own preferences. We need to ask the question, are we being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ or are we starting to make him out to be like ourselves? Brothers, I don't want cheap imitation religion. I want the real thing. I want a scary God who's going to convict me of my sins. I want a scary God who loves me enough to not leave Dan Wolf in his messed up, hell-bound situation. I want, to, I want to experience the real God. I want to feel a fresh wind on my face that is, deals in reality and truth. I don't want a God who I can just lie and pretend and start using him to manipulate and work over other people. That, what a shame to settle for, for human religion. What a farce. What a joke. So sad. We don't want religion that you and I can make up. I don't want it. I wouldn't be here. I want something real that has the power to convict, that has the power to transform, that's calling me to something better than myself, not something I use to pat myself on the back and feel better than other people. 
We don't use religion to just feel better about other people. We want, to, we want to access God's power so that we can be more like him. When God gets too convenient, he's probably not God. God wasn't meant to be convenient. He's not tame after all. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I don't want to try to remake him in my mind to be just like me. Then how can he help me? I know I'm a mess. I don't want God to be like me. Boy, that, wouldn't that be a, a scary place if God ended up being just like us? <laughs> Jesus should challenge us to the core. He's not convenient. God is not comfortable, and he never will be if we want the real God. Everybody with me? Amen. Yeah. Thank goodness for grace, right? Let's turn to Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6, 1 through 15. Then next week, I'm so excited. Uh, I loved our study in, in Matthew on the, on the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going we're gonna to have next week to, to hit some of those things again here. Short version in Luke. One Sabbath, Jesus was... So the context of Jesus fighting with the, the human religion, right? He says, we're not going to be able to fit what I'm doing in the old structure of man-made religion. What I'm doing is brand new. We need new wineskins for this Holy Spirit wine. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. The disciples, they were hungry, they began to pick some of the heads of grain, and they were rubbing them in their hands to eat the kernels. Now, here's a tricky thing. Poor people, people who are hungry in a desperate situation, were allowed to go through other people's fields or orchards and grab something to eat. You were not allowed to start harvesting. And on the Sabbath day, you were not allowed to prepare food. You had to prepare the food you were going to eat on the Sabbath the night before. So they were grabbing kernels of corn, which may be technically accurate, but if they started to prepare the food by rubbing the grains together so it was easier to eat, then some people who were really trying to impose the uh, human way of interpreting the law would say, well, they're preparing their food. And so... They're going, they're going to be called to task because they started eating some of these grains. Not because they were hungry and started eating, but because they started to prepare it. Jesus answered them. Uh, uh, we'll go back to verse 2 there. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And you know, they were ticked off when they said it. Jesus answered them, Have you never read... And it's funny that Jesus doesn't engage them on their level by arguing about the minutian rules of the law. Instead, he tells them a story, tries to put everything in context. Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's claiming to be greater than King David here, this great like, patron saint of Israel. Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the one who made the Sabbath. I'm the one who defines the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. Very possibly he was planted there by the Pharisees to test Jesus. So they put a man whose hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law we're looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely. And you get this idea. You know when people are being critical, judgmental, and they're just watching you to screw up. They're watching you to say something they don't like. They're watching you to, you to do something they don't like. They're just watching to see what you've got in your cup. They're watching to see how you dress. They're watching to see how you talk. They're just watching you in order to judge you, not because they love you and we're all ch iron sharpening iron. We're all trying to get better together but because they don't love you and they, they want to they wanna devalue and they want to elevate themselves. So they're watching to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. 
do you notice something that's really weird here? One, they believe Jesus cares enough about people to go out of his way to heal them. And they believe he has the power. They're not doubting he has the power to heal. These are enemies that absolutely are sure that Jesus can heal. And so they put this plant here and they're watching them. <gasps> He's going to bless that person on the Sabbath. What sad, what, what a sad place when your religion forces you to miss God. What a sad place when, when you're so religious and can't care. You can't even celebrate with a guy who's he's got this withered hand, probably paralyzed. You can't, you can't celebrate when God heals him because it doesn't fit into your narrow paradigm. You've already decided what's what, and uh, you're going to be critical of even God himself when he doesn't abide by your rules. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to excuse Jesus. They watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, but Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So Jesus is taking the challenge straight on. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? He looked around at all of them, and they're not talking because they're ornery and they know they're wrong. But they're also not repenting because there's a difference between knowing you're wrong and being stubborn and holding on to it and falling down at the feet of Jesus Christ saying, please forgive me, what was wrong with me? What was I thinking? Why did I harbor this attitude in my heart? Jesus said, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. The muscle fiber was built back. I bet he had a better hand than he ever had before. I wonder if he got, ever got arthritis in the hand. Got arthritis in his hand. Oh, this is the Jesus hand. This one's feeling pretty good. I, I wonder, you know, I don't know how, how he did it, but his hand was restored like never before. Completely but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious, and my heart breaks for these guys. I feel so bad. Love stood before them. The hope, the, the glory of the universe condensed right in front of them in the shape of a man. Healing, forgiveness, beauty, goodness, everything wonderful about life stood right in front of them. And when he heals and brings truth, speaks truth to them, they are furious. They're just so angry. When we get angry like that, we have brain cramps. That's what that's called. That's a brain cramp. I can no longer think because I'm furious. And they began to discuss with one another what they might do with Jesus. Another gospel says they began to talk about how to kill Jesus. Isn't that sad? After he heals somebody, they start saying, how can we get rid of this guy? Brothers and sisters, we can do religion in such a way that you hear a true message from Jesus and you say, I don't want to go to this church. I want to go to a church where people are just going to tickle my ears. I don't want to hear this message. It's too convicting. This Jesus, the real God, is always right in my face and he's trying to mold me and shape me. I want a God who just pats me on the back and says, whatever you do is good. Whatever you think is good. And you're better than everybody else. I want that kind of God. Right? We feel that way sometimes, right? That's a God without power. That's a fake God. That's a God not worth getting out of bed for on Sunday morning. One of those days, now look at this, the contrast between these nasty, hard-headed Pharisees, and thank God some of them came out and believed, right? Jesus loves these folks too. But look at the contrast between them they're, they're only focused on fighting what God is doing. They're, they're resisting the Holy Spirit. Now look at the contrast. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. Well, I think I'm at a place in my life where I don't have to spend much time pr in prayer. God knows my heart, and I know his. Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. The sinless one. Maybe it's because he loved his father and wanted to talk to him. I think if I loved God more, I'd spend more time talking to him. I really believe that. I love talking with God, and I think if I love talking with God more, I'd do it more. When morning came, 
He called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them. So he's, these guys sitting around plotting how to kill, Jesus is plotting it in prayer. Plotting is not the best word. Planning how he's going to expand his ministry, how he's going to bring the blessings of God to more people. So he gathers his disciples, and he chooses 12 of them. He's going to designate these 12 as apostles. Simon, whom he decides to call Peter, meaning rock, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, this, this traitor is now one of them. Thomas, we all call him what? Doubting Thomas, Jesus chose him. James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, which we're not exactly sure what that means, but there was a category of people called Zealots that were basically terrorists. They probably came at a slightly later time period than this, but he may have had that real, he was probably a really a patriotic uh, really wanted to kill Romans. He was a fiery guy. And he says, yeah, I'm going to put you in the mix too, and I'm going to teach you. <laughs> and he's bringing all these people. And Judas, son of James, and he's so glad that we put son of James there so we don't con- confuse him with the other Judas, Iscariot, who became a traitor. So Jesus gets his inner group together, and he's going to go out, and he's going to change the world. We're, what do we say? Jesus didn't come to rock the boat. People say, don't rock the boat. Jesus is going to sink the boat. He's got, he's got a whole new way of doing things. He's not going to do things the way the world does it. God's economy is totally different. The things God values are not the things that we value. Uh, goodness incarnate, brothers and sisters, stands before us today through the scriptures. We experience the goodness and power of God uh, through our spirit because of the Holy Spirit. God acts still today in power. He still acts in love. We don't want to be so full of old wine. Well, religious people do this. Well, religion does that. We don't want to be so full of old wine, we miss it. What a tragedy to miss God because of our preconceived notion of religion. Can I say that again? What a tragedy if we miss God because of our preconceptions about what religion is really all about. J. Vernon McGee wrote, The man with the withered hand was planted there, you may be sure. In doing this, they, the Pharisees, really paid our Lord a wonderful compliment. They believed he could heal him, and they believed he would heal him. They knew he was both powerful and compassionate. They were exactly correct in their estimation of him. Our Lord healed the man. Then his enemies used the occasion uh, to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath day. Matthew tells us that they plotted his death from that moment on. The Pharisees were so caught up in preconception of religion man-made religion, they missed out on Jesus. What are we going to do? Are we going to miss Jesus because of our human conception of religion, because of the way our culture does it, the way our parents did it, the way it's always been done, the way way we grew up? While While they were busy plotting Christ's destruction, Luke keeps the narrative rolling by telling us how Christ goes out to recruit his disciples. Christ is focused on reaching more people. Yeah, they hated him. He didn't sit around, oh, Lord, why do they hate me? Some people hate the church today. What are we going to do? Sit around, oh, Lord, why do they hate us? You know, I told you in the Bible, they hated me. They're going to hate you too, right? Yeah, but I kind of wanted everybody to like me. Jesus said the world opposes him. They're going to oppose us too. Now, what are we going to do? sit around and fuss and complain and pout? Are we going to go out and start winning more people? Going to go out and start showing love to people and winning them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus, while people were plotting his death, is still planning, how am I going to get the kingdom out? How am I going to reach more people? How am I going to expand the kingdom of God? He goes about blessing. He goes about healing. He goes about teaching. Not spending all his time worrying about what unsaved people think about him. What a trap if we don't spread the gospel because we're worried about what unsaved people think about us. The contrast with human-oriented religion is astounding. And human religion is dead religion. The answer to dead religion is always going to be more Jesus. The answer to dead religion is always going to be more Jesus. And either we're going to run to Jesus and let him work on us and, and chisel away at all these nasty parts of us even when that's painful, or else we're going to become numb to true teaching 
We're going to miss the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to miss what God is doing. And we will be motivated, maybe by bitterness, maybe by anger, maybe by a superiority complex, maybe uh, really just enjoying looking at other people's hypocrisy. You know when you enjoy other people's sins, you're in a bad spot. (laughs) Those people are such hypocrites. (laughs) You're in a bad spot, my friend. God's heart breaks over sin. My heart should break for other people's sin, not celebrate it. I don't want to be motivated by the dark side of the force and uh, more concerned uh, with doing things the way we've always been doing them by trying to force God into my parameters, my or wineskins, than being in tune with what God really wants to do in our lives. I don't want to be like a Pharisee who misses out on God. How sad to miss Jesus because of pride. How sad to miss the Savior because of broken, false religion. And how wonderful to stop fighting with Jesus. Not going to do it anymore. I admit I'm a sinner. I admit my guilt. I know it. Why would I? I'm going to leave behind empty religion. I'm not going to let false religion hold me back. I want to acknowledge my hypocrisy. I struggle with hypocrisy. And I'm going to take the grace and run. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.